Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nervisesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we welcome everyone to our study of Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav. And we're on third canto and we're looking at chapter number three. So, I'll just begin with the PowerPoint presentation for this chapter, give you a chance to see the main parts of the chapter. Right, so the third chapter is dealing with the Lord's pastimes out of Vrindavan. And you can see in the picture, the illustration, the Lord Krishna came out of Vrindavan to go to Mathura. And there in the wrestling arena, Lord Krishna dealt with King Kamsa. After they defeated the wrestlers and before that also there was the elephant Kuvala Yapida. But the real mission in coming to Mathura was to deal with Kamsa. And Lord Krishna de dealt with him and then freed Vasudeva and Devaki, his mother and father from the prison and uh, then different pastimes took place. So Krishna married many queens beginning with Rukmini and defeated many demons. Demons were not only in Vrindavan, once they came out of Vrindavan there were also different demons coming to attack Krishna. They wanted to get Mathura, they wanted to take control of Mathura, different things happened. And then even when Krishna was in Dwarka, some demons came to Dwarka, tried to attack there. So one of the pastimes also which took place while Krishna was out of Mathura, out of Vrindavan when he was living in Dwarka, then it, it came time for the battle of Kurukshetra and the annihilation of, after that, after the battle of Kurukshetra, we'll hear about the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty. Lord Krishna has to arrange for the Yadu dynasty to leave the world. The, the members of the Yadu dynasty were really a big number, there were millions of them. And, and they had become quite proud and confident Lord Krishna was worried about them being there if he was not present. So Lord Krishna arranged that before he departed from the world, they would first of all depart. So we'll hear about that. Shown here the second section of the chapter from 16 to 23. Krishna was the king of Dwarka. But although he was the king of Dwarka, he was subordinate to Maharaj Yudhisthir. Maharaj Yudhisthir was the emperor. So Lord Krishna, although he's the supreme lord, he accepted subordination to Maharaj Yudhisthir. And then the Lord manifests his detachment from ephemeral sex. Lord Krishna has, uh, he married 16,108 wives, so he had a lot of uh, 
wives and he had a lot of children by all of them also, ten children by each, ten sons. So he was involved with the family affairs. Anyway, the end of the chapter we'll hear about the departure of the Yadu dynasty from the earth. That comes in the final four verses of the chapter and it continues into the fourth chapter also. So one of the pastimes which took place also, after Lord Krishna killed Kamsa, that happened in the first verse of the third chapter, and then in the second verse we heard about the Lord, he learned all the Vedas with their different branches, simply by hearing them once from his teacher, Sandipani Muni, whom he rewarded by bringing back his dead son from the region of Yamaloka. It's an, a wonderful pastime and it helps us to understand the inconceivable po power of Lord Krishna, his achincha shakti, that after Lord Krishna had received teachings from Sandipani Muni for a total of 64 days, then Sandipani Muni requested Guru Dakshin and the Guru Dakshin he requested was that you bring back my son from death. And Krishna and Balaram did that. They went first of all to, to the beach and they killed the demon Panchajana who was in the ocean but they didn't find the son there. I told the story in the last class. And then they went to Yamaloka and from Yamaraj they brought back the son in his same body. They brought him back to Sandipani Muni. All right? And then the third verse, we can hear, we heard about how Krishna married Rukmini. Attracted by the beauty and fortune of Rukmini, the daughter of King Bhishmaka, many great princes and kings assembled to marry her. But Lord Krishna, stepping over the other hopeful candidates, carried her away as his own share as Garuda carried away nectar. So Rukmini is the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, and she's always the consort of the Supreme Lord. So Lord Krishna took his rightful share. And here you see in this next slide, Lord Krishna dealing with the bulls. And this was in order to take the hand of Princess Nagnajiti that her father arranged this for a, a suitable groom for his daughter, that first you have to bind up these seven wild bulls. So uh, by subduing seven bulls whose noses were not pierced, the Lord achieved the hand of Princess Nagnajiti in the open competition to select her bridegroom. Although the Lord was victorious, his competitors asked the hand of the princess, and thus there was a fight. Well equipped with weapons, the Lord killed or wounded all of them, but he was not hurt himself. So this was another wife for Lord Krishna. And then we told also the story about Lord Krishna taking uh, Satyabhama, to the heavenly planets, just to please his dear wife, Satyabhama that is, the Lord brought back the Parijata tree from heaven, just as an ordinary husband would do. But Indra, the king of heaven, induced by his wives, henpecked as he was, ran after the Lord with full force to fight him. So Indra had become overwhelmed well, influenced by his wives, his wives were complaining that they're taking the Parijata tree from heaven. It belongs here, they shouldn't take it to earth. And Indra tried to fight Krishna, and Krishna defeated Indra. All right, and then the next pastime shown here, Narakasur, the son of Daritri, tried to grasp the whole sky, and for this, he was killed by the Lord in a fight. 
His mother then prayed to the Lord. His mother, Darit, da, Daritri, she is actually Bhumi and she's an expansion of Satyabhama. So Satyabhama had come with Lord Krishna when Lord Krishna fought Narakasura because Bhumi had given, a, she received a vow that the Lord would not kill her son unless she gave permission. So Krishna brought Satyabhama and Satyabhama gave permission. <laughs> kill the demon, kill this demon, Narak, and Krishna killed him. So his mother then prayed to the Lord. This led to the return of the kingdom to the son of Narakasura. And thus the Lord entered the house of the demon. There all the princesses kidnapped by Narakasura at once became alert upon seeing the Lord, the friend of the distressed. So all these young princesses had been kidnapped by Narakasura and they were being held captive. And nobody would marry them because they'd already been touched, been taken by this Narakasura. So Lord Krishna accepted all of them as his wives. They looked upon him with eagerness, joy and shyness and offered to be his wives. All those princesses were lodged in different apartments and the Lord simultaneously assumed different bodily expansions, exactly matching each and every princess. He accepted their hands in perfect rituals by his internal potency. So it's a very wonderful pastime. In the material world, a man has one wife, usually. Well, some, some men may have a few more wives, but we never heard of anybody having 16,100 wives. But Krishna didn't just have, have them for, uh, uh, for one person. Krishna expanded himself to be with each and every one of the wives. And when they married, Krishna expanded himself so that the marriages were all performed at the same time in the 16,108 palaces. And Krishna's mother and father also expanded themselves to be at each and every marriage. So very wonderful pastime. It shows us, again, the achincha shakti, the inconceivable potency of Lord Krishna. People, when they hear about this kind of pastime, they say, oh, this is just fictitious, this is not really true, this is just a story. But you have to understand, this is the nature of the Supreme Lord. When the personality of Godhead performs pastimes, it's for his pleasure. The pleasure would be very limited if you just had one wife. But the Lord enjoys unlimitedly. He has 16,108 of the most beautiful wives. All of these princesses, 16,000 of them, they're all uh, representatives of his 16 potencies. He has some 16 potencies. And these potencies are like different phases of the moon. And within the moon, there's, a, you know, 1,000 different, within each division of the moon, which is 16 divisions, each division is divided into 1,000. So you have 16,000 queens here who are all here for the pleasure of Lord Krishna to make his pastimes enjoyable, supremely enjoyable. Another pastime we heard was how Lord Krishna killed, or rather he didn't kill them himself, but he arranged for his devotees to kill them. One was the Kalayavana, Kalayavana was burned to ashes by Muchukunda, and the other was the king of Magadha. King of Magadha is Jarasandha, and Jarasandha, he was killed by Bhim. So it is described there how three kings, three demon kings were all attacking Mathura at the same time, Kalayavana, Jarasandha, and Salva. But when the city was encircled by their soldiers, 
the Lord refrained from killing them personally, just to show the power of his own men. His own men, meaning Muchukunda and Bhima, how they killed them. Here's Muchikunda burning Kalayavna to ashes. Of kings like Samba, Dwivida, Bana, Mora, Bova, and many other demons, such as Dantavakra, some he killed himself, and some he caused to be killed by others, Sri Baladeva, etc. And then we came to Kurukshetra to hear about the Lord's pastimes there. O Vidura, the Lord caused all the kings, both the enemies and the uh, oh, oh, and and those. What I'm not able to read it. I've got something blocking. Can someone read it for me? Both the enemies and those. What? Then O Vidura, the Lord caused. Oh, Lord caused all the kings, both the enemies and those on the side of your fighting nephews. To be killed in the battle of Kurukshetra. All those kings were so great and strong that the earth seemed to shake as they tra traversed the war field. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, so Krishna arranged for all of these people, both sides, both the enemies and on people on his side, they all died. The earth was overburdened by so many of the kings. So the battle of Kurukshetra took place and that helped to reduce the burden on the earth planet. Okay. And then we'll hear about the disappearance of the Yadu dynasty. So the Kauravas, they were all destroyed in the battle of Kurukshetra, but Lord Krishna is worried about the Yadu dynasty. That they have to leave the world also. And they were so strong, nobody could kill them. So they killed each other and they fought with each other. And you can see in the illustration, they, were so, they became so intoxicated, they were fighting even with Krishna and Balaram. So Krishna and Balaram had to fight with them also. All right. Here's a quote from Srila Prabhupada. The devotees and associates of the Lord are completely surrendered souls. Thus they are transcendental instruments in the hands of the Lord and can be used in any way the devotee desires. The pure devotees also enjoy such pastimes of the Lord because they want to see him happy. Devotees of the Lord never assert independent individuality. On the contrary, they utilize their individuality in pursuit of the desires of the Lord. And this cooperation of the devotees with the Lord makes a perfect scene of the Lord's pastimes. So this is from third chapter, text number 15 describing about the independent nature of the devotee. That we shouldn't think that devotee doesn't have independence. People say, oh, I like to be free, I like to do what I want. So we're free. Yeah, we, we also do what we want. But a devotee wants to serve the desire of the Lord. Those who are not devotees, they simply want their sense gratification. They're controlled by the modes of nature. They're not free, but a pure devotee, those who are, take shelter of Krishna, they will enjoy the pastimes of Krishna and they want to see Krishna happy. And they know that Krishna is happy when, they, when he sees his devotees act according to the religious principles and help him in his mission. Of course, the mission of the Lord is to establish Dharma, to establish the religious principles in the world. And that was one of the reasons why the Lord wanted Maharaj Yudhisthira to be the king, to be the emperor. He wanted a devotee on the throne. So Prabhupada is explaining about the individuality, individual independence, 
independent, of independent individuality. They never assert independent individuality. On the contrary, they utilize their individuality in pursuit of the desires of Krishna. So this is the best use of our independence is to take shelter of Krishna and to help Lord Krishna in his mission to fulfill the desires of the Lord. What is the desire of the Lord? The Lord desires. He's given many instructions in Bhagavad Gita, right? Manmana bhava madbhakto and then sarva dharmam parigyasna and all these different verses are there in Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna is describing what should be the desire of the devotee, how to use our individuality, use it for the service of Krishna. Okay? And then, in relation to the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty, what lesson do we learn from that? Well, we'll look at that in a little while. You could be thinking about what lesson did we learn from the disappearance of the Yadu dynasty. Oh, well, it's kind of described for us here. You can just read it. So, judging from all sides, the Yadus were perfectly trained, civilized persons. And their being cursed by the Brahmana sages was only by the desire of the Lord. Right? The Yadus were... Well, we'll tell about that in a, in a little while. There's more time. But anyway, there was a curse. The Brahmana sages, you can see all the great sages, Narada and so many other great, great sages, Vishwamitra, so many great sages had all come there. And they, there was some joking going on. You can see the children there, the young boys down there. They were joking around and they had dressed up Samba. You can see there's a woman there in a sari. That's actually Samba, who is the, the, the son of Lord Krishna. And so he's dressed up like a woman. And they had put a big metal ball over his belly. And they pretended, they, they brought him to the sages and they said to the sages in a joking manner, you know, they're young boys, so young children, they like to joke, they like to pray, play around. So they brought Samba dressed like a woman and it looked like she's pregnant. And they said to the sages, oh great sages, what kind of child is this woman going to give birth to? And the sages, the sages cursed. They said, this woman's going to give birth to something which will destroy the whole Yadu dynasty. So it happened like that. So there was a curse from the sages, and this curse was only by the desire of the Lord. The whole incident was a warning to all concerned that no one should behave lightly with Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. So this is the lesson what we're supposed to learn from the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty, that we should not behave lightly with Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. We shouldn't joke with them and make fool of them. It's a very dangerous thing. You can see what happened here, that these sages were not pleased. They brought this Samba and they're pretending he's a woman. <laughs> and so the sages said, he will give birth and this, he's going to give birth to something which will destroy the whole Yadu dynasty. So it happened that actually that they had put a big metal ball over the belly of Samba and covered it by the sari. So it was a big iron ball. So when the curse, when the sages cursed like that, then the, the, the children and the other people around who heard the curse, they all went to Maharaj Ugrasena. Maharaj Ugrasena was the king, right? So Maharaj Ugrasena ordered that that metal ball should be ground into dust. It should be made filings, it should be made powder, and then thrown into the sea. So they did that. They ground the metal ball into dust and threw it into the sea. But there was one piece 
There was one piece in that ball which somehow they couldn't grind it. It just wouldn't grind. So that, that one piece, that was also thrown into the sea. And it happened that one piece of metal which was thrown into the sea, that was swallowed by a fish. And later on that fish was caught in someone's net. And then when the person was eating the fish, they brought out that metal piece of metal from the belly of the fish. And it happened that that piece of metal went to the hunter Jara. And the hunter Jara then used that piece of metal to make an arrowhead. And it said that that arrowhead was the one which was fired at Lord Krishna. And the metal filings which were thrown into the sea, they were all washed ashore. And they went into the reeds which were growing along the shore there. And so it happened that the Yadu dynasty, they had all gone to a place along the, along the shore, Prabhakshitra, and they were doing rituals there. It was observed that there was a lot of bad omens, inauspicious omens. So every, they decided we will all go to Prabhakshetra and we will do auspicious activities to counteract the omens because the omens were very inauspicious. Inauspicious things like there was an aura around the sun and there were earthquakes in different places. So these were very inauspicious signs. So they went to Prabhakshetra and they performed rituals there. They gave a lot of charity to the Brahmanas. They brought a lot of wealth there to give in charity to the Brahmanas. But it happened that all the Yadu dynasty who had gone there and all the ones who went there actually to Prabhakshetra, these were all the demigods who had come to take part in Lord Krishna's pastimes. Lord Krishna's eternal associates, they didn't go there. They simply stayed in Dwarka. His eternal associates remained in Dwarka. But uh, the demigods who had come to take part in the Lord's pastimes, they all went to Prabhakshetra. And then after they performed all the rituals and fed the brahmanas, they fed them the best food, and they gave them the best charity, they gave them everything they wanted. It said even if some brahmanas didn't, ha didn't have a wife, <coughs> they arranged girls for them to marry, and they gave all kinds of, many, many cows, of course. So they gave a lot of charity. But then they, they drank, they began to drink some uh, alcohol, some honey or some kind of intoxicating beverage. They began to drink that intoxicating beverage and then, influenced by the potency of the Lord, they began to fight with each other. And there were millions of them there and they all began to fight with each other and it was a terrible scene. The grandfather would fight with the grandson and the brother would fight with the other brother and the friend would fight with this friend, and they were all fighting with each other. And they fought with each other, and they used up all of their weapons, and when their weapons were all exhausted, then they, they brought these reeds. And these reeds, which uh, initially they were just grass reeds, and somehow by the iron filings, and by the desire of the Supreme Lord, these reeds became like metal rods. And so they began to fight with these metal rods, killing each other. And just, it was just an, an incredible scene. And Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram were both there. And sometimes they would also attack Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram, and they would also have to fight. And in this way, everyone was killed. They, everyone, they all killed each other. There was no one left. So, the warning from this pastime, the disappearance of the Yadu dynasty is, we should be very careful how we behave with the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. 
So we mention here six types of offenders. And because we, we have to know how to properly deal with uh, Vaishnavas and devotees. So what we should do is uh, avoid offending them. So first of all, number one offense, if somebody tries to kill a Vaishnava, that's a great offense. And then if you blaspheme a Vaishnava, blasphemy, you may bless, you may criticize a Vaishnava on different ways. You may say, oh, before he was a devotee, before he became a devotee, he was a very sinful person. I remember him before he became a Vaishnava. Now he's a Vaishnava, but before he was a Vaishnava, he was very bad. He did so many bad things and we may criticize him from the past. We may criticize someone on the basis of their birth. That is also an offense. And we may criticize someone because they may do something just by chance, not intentionally, but just by chance. And so we should not criticize people on these basis. This is blasphemy. If you criticize their birth or you may criticize even their initiation and things. Number three, on seeing a Vaishnava, if one does not pay obeisances, then this is also an offense. We may, we may not bow down, we may not bow down, but at least within the mind we should respect the devotee. Within the mind we respect and we offer the words, we can say, we can also say, please accept my humble obeisances. You may not actually bow down. So obeisances can be offered body or with the mind or with the words. And if we don't do that, it's an offense. Number four, if we get angry with a Vaishnava, this is also bad. This is not proper behavior. Number five, we develop enmity towards a Vaishnava. We, oh, I don't like this person. No, no, I don't like him. Oh, that's not good. We have some bodily feeling. We should see all devotees as representatives of Krishna. Number six, one who does not become jolly on seeing a Vaishnava. If we, if we don't feel, if we're not happy to see a, a Vaishnava, that's an offense. We should feel happy. Oh, a devotee, very nice. We should feel very good. This is all mentioned in Skanda Purana, by the way. It's all there in Skanda Purana. You can read these different kinds of offenders. So we should be con conscious of these things and avoid the offenses. Okay, now the symptoms of a sadhu from Harinam Chintamani. One who is fully surrendered to Lord Krishna will naturally only chant Lord Krishna's name. Thus, such a person is entitled to be called a sadhu by the Lord's grace. Only a devotee of Lord Krishna is eligible to be respected as a sadhu, none others. If anyone else proclaims himself a sadhu, he is but a charlatan and a braggart. One who humbly says he is a poor soul, surrendered to Lord Krishna, who constantly chants Krishna's name, is a real sadhu. He, considering himself lower than a blade of grass and more tolerant than a tree, offers all respects to others without expecting any for himself. The holy name of Krishna grants such a sadhu divine love of Godhead. So the main symptom of a sadhu is that he chants the holy name. And then you can see, uh, we're quoting from the third verse of Shikshastikam, that we should think of ourselves lower than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree. In other words, the sadhu should be very humble and should be very tolerant. People may not be very nice to him, but he doesn't mind. He, he will offer all respects and he doesn't expect any respect for himself. That is the real sadhu that he he's very humble and he doesn't demand any respect. 
Okay, so we have to know how to recognize the sadhu. And here you can see they're also saying that if he's not a devotee of Krishna, then he can't be a sadhu. Only devotees of Krishna can be a sadhu. All right, going ahead, then Harinam Chintamani also tells us about remedies for sadhu ninda. If we offend a sadhu, what's the remedy? So here it said, if anyone offends a sadhu in a moment of delusion and madness, he must fall at the sadhu's feet and repent bitterly, weeping and full of contrition. He must beg forgiveness. He should declare himself a fallen wretch in need of a Vaishnava's grace. A sadhu is very merciful. His heart will soften and he will embrace the offender, thus ex exonerating him from his offences. So this is what we have to do, we have to weep, we have to fall at his feet and beg forgiveness, we have to be very genuine in, in requesting forgiveness and we have to declare ourselves to be a fallen wretch and beg the mercy of the devotee. So try to avoid that, we don't want to go through all that. All right, so that's the PowerPoint presentation. I just wanted to show you that. We're going to go back to the text now. Uh, okay, is everybody able to see the text? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we were up to text number 14. Text 14, after the battle of Kurukshetra, the Lord said, the abatement of the earth's great burden, 18 Akshahinis, has now been effected with the help of Drona, Bhishma, Arjuna and Bhima. But what is this? There is still the great strength of the Yadu dynasty, born of myself which may be a more unbearable burden. So Lord Krishna is describing here how during the battle of Kurukshetra with the help of Drona and Bhishma and then Arjuna and Bhima, then so many of the people at the battle of Kurukshetra were all killed. So that gave a lot of relief from the, to the earth planet, that so many soldiers, the, the Kshatriyas were removed from the planet. But Lord Krishna is still concerned about his own dynasty, the Yadu dynasty. And then it's, it's huge and it expanded to millions of people. And Lord Krishna was worried about the burden which the Yadu dynasty was. So in the purport, Srila Prabhupada comments how there's two kinds of burden. There's the burden of the beast and the burden of love. So the burden of the beast is the burden which is simply due, the, the people who are on the planet, they simply want to abuse the planet and have it for their own sense gratification. So Mother Earth does not like that burden, that these people are just exploiting her resources and taking everything for their own sense gratification. That is the burden of the beast. So they were, remo uh, many of these people were removed, not a difficult problem for Lord Krishna, but there's the burden of love. and. It's pointed out in the purport, there are three different examples given about the burden of love. He talks about how the burden of the husband on the young wife, the burden, oh this is at the top here, uh, the burden of the husband on the young wife and the burden of the son on the lap of the mother and the burden of wealth on the businessman. Although 
actually burdened from the from the viewpoint of heaviness are sources of pleasure and in the absence of such burdensomeness objects one may feel the burden of separation which is heavier to bear than the actual burden of love so the acharyas in analyzing this verse they talk about the the meaning because lord krishna was saying he worried about his own dynasty that's a more unbearable burden it's a burden to the earth planet an unbearable burden but when lord krishna or oh, this is uddhava speaking uddhava speaking uh, he's talking about the burden of separation not so much the burden of love uh, burden of the beast but the burden of separation, of the burden of a, a very special kind of love, even greater than love, it's the burden of separation. So the earth planet may feel the burden of love, but when they leave the planet, they will be even more unbearable, the separation from all the devotees. Prabhupada in the purport talks about there's no problem for overpopulation. You know, some people say, oh, the battle of Kurukshetra was necessary because there was too much population. Or the Yadu dynasty had to annihilate itself because it was overpopulated. There were too many people on the planet and the earth cannot provide for everyone. It's not true. The, there's enough for everyone. But the, the problem is when the people are demoniac, if they have very, if they are engaged in irreligious activities, then it, it creates a burden on the planet. But there's no problem to have a planet full of religious people. And Prabhupada talks, he said that the, the number of human beings on the planet is only a very small number of the living entities on the planet. There's so many other living entities. There's so many others in the sea and on the mountains and everywhere around the planet. There's many, many other billions and billions of living entities. And overpopulation, the human being, human race, if they increase, it's not a, pro a problem for Mother Earth. She can provide, provided the people are pious and religious. But when they're irreligious, then it's a burden for Mother Earth. So that's one point which is brought up. And then they talk about this difference between the burden of the beast and the burden of love. Mo Mother Earth is happy to have many devotees on her planet. And the whole planet can be full of devotees and more and more devotees. No problem. Mother Earth can provide for all of them. And she's happy to have religious, pious, God-conscious people on her planet. But if the people are just sinful materialists, then it's a burden for her. So here in this particular case, Uddhava was talking about the, uh, the burden of the Yadu dynasty. And There is still the great strength of the Yadu dynasty, born of myself, which may be a more unbearable burden. This is the words of Lord Krishna, not Uddhava, but we're hearing generally from Uddhava. Uddhava is repeating what Lord Krishna had actually said. Uddhava is describing to Vidura that Lord Krishna had remarked like this. Because Lord Krishna was thinking about the actual situation. Lord Krishna knew that his mission had been accomplished and it was time for him to leave the world. So he has to make arrangements for his departure. But he thought if he leaves the world, then that pain of separation would be unbearable for the Yadu dynasty. The Yadu dynasty would be, because they were all great devotees. The Yadu dynasty were not ordinary people. 
Many were demigods and others were the eternal associates of Lord Krishna who'd come from the spiritual world. So they were worried, Lord Krishna was thinking that if he left first, then they, the Yadu dynasty would go berserk. They would just, they would be so, they would lament so much the separation from Lord Krishna. Therefore, Lord Krishna thought better that he arranges that the Yadu dynasty will leave first. And that's why he arranged this uh, fratricidal war, the family feud, how they all kill each other. So that is what happened. The, the pain of separation, if they have to feel the separation from Krishna, would be unbearable for them. Prabhupada remarks in the purport, I'll just read this, that the large numbers of family members born of Lord Krishna counted to some millions and were certainly a great increase in the population of the earth. But because all of them were expansions of the Lord himself, by his transcendental plenary expansions, they were a source of great pleasure for the earth. Right? The, the devotees, they're a source of pleasure for the earth. So, reading a bit more. When the Lord referred to them in connection with the burden of the earth, he had in mind their imminent disappearance from the earth. All the members of the family of Lord Krishna were incarnations of different demigods, and they were to disappear from the surface of the earth along with the Lord. So when he referred to the unbearable heaviness on the earth in connection with the Yadu dynasty, he was referring to the burden of their separation. Srila Jiva Goswami confirms this inference. All right? So the, the separation from the Lord. Lord Krishna has to arrange everything very nicely, just as he did speaking the Bhagavad Gita. So, he arranged everything for Maharaj Yudhisthira to take the throne. So similarly, he has to arrange for his departure. And he doesn't want to leave and the world go into chaos. He came to establish God consciousness in the, on the planet. So he doesn't want that to be lost. Okay, going ahead, text 15. When they quarrel among themselves, influenced by intoxication, with their eyes red like copper because of drinking madhu, then only will they disappear, otherwise it will not be possible. On my disappearance, this incident will take place. All right. Reading a little bit, Prabhupada's purport, he says, the only means Therefore, for their disappearance was the make show of a fight among themselves, as if bringing in, as if, as if brawling in intoxication due to drinking. That so-called fighting would also take place by the will of the Lord, otherwise there would be no cause for the fighting. And Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like Arjuna was made to fight in the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna was put into illusion. He was thinking, I didn't want to fight. Lord Krishna had to teach him. He had to convince him. Arjuna was influenced by family affection. So the Yadu dynasty, by the will of the Lord, they were made to become intoxicated. And then they fought with each other. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada says, devotees of the Lord never assert independent individuality. On the contrary, 
they utilize their individuality in pursuance of the desires of the Lord. So the desire of the Lord is what is important to the devotee. So the Lord desired that they would all leave the world. They, if they just simply stay there without Him, it will be useless, it will be chaos. So Lord Krishna arranged them all to go there, to be intoxicated and to fight with each other and destroy themselves. Nobody else could kill them. Nobody else could harm them. They were so powerful. They were so strong. But another thing was, they'd also become very proud because they knew they were the Yadu dynasty. They knew they were protected by Lord Krishna and they knew their strength. So they became very proud of that. And Lord Krishna knew all that. This was arranged also. This pride which they have. Although they're great devotees, they have that pride. So Lord Krishna had arranged that pride of them so that they could come together and fight with each other and, and then go back to their positions. The demigods went back to the heavenly planets and Lord Krishna's eternal associates, they went back to the spiritual world. Okay, text 16, Lord Krishna, thus thinking to himself, established Maharaj Yudhisthira in the position of supreme control of the world in order to show the ideal administration on the path of piety. So Maharaj Yudhisthira is a devotee. That's his main qualification, to become the emperor of the world, that he's a great devotee of the Lord. Therefore, he was put into that position. Lord Krishna wanted him to have that position. Text 17 describes about how the Lord protected Maharaj Parikshit when he was in the womb of Uttara. He was born by the weapon of the son of Drona, Ashwatthama's weapon, but later he was again protected by the Lord. This was, this is Uddhava telling these pastimes. The particular living entity, Prabhupada's purport, a little section which I've marked, the particular living entity who was selected to be the descendant of Maharaj Puru or the Pandavas was not an ordinary living entity. And by the supreme will of the Lord, he was destined to be the successor of Maharaj Yudhisthira. So this is Maharaj Parikshit. He's being described. He's the son of Abhimanu in the womb of Uttara. And Maharaj Parikshit becomes the successor of Maharaj Yudhisthira. After Lord Krishna leaves the world, then the Pandavas also retire. They go up to the mountains. And at that, they put Parikshit onto the throne. So Parikshit is described, he's not an ordinary living entity. He's a very special soul who's given the opportunity to take that position. And of course, out he will hear Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, going ahead, text number uh, 18. We hear about Maharaj Yudhisthira performing three horse sacrifices under the direction of Lord Krishna. And then uh, following Krishna, the personality of Godhead protected and enjoyed the earth, assisted by his younger brothers. So Maharaj Yudhisthira mentioned here, he was the ideal monarchical representative on the earth because he was a constant follower of the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. That is the most important qualification. He must be a devotee. So Maharaj Yudhisthira took the throne, became the emperor, and Lord Krishna is the king of Dwarka. They may be ruling Dwarka, but they're under the subjugation of the emperor. Maharaj Yudhisthira is the supreme ruler. Although Krishna is the Paramishwara, but in the material sense, 
he's under the rule of Maharaj Yudhisthira. Then 19 describes about the city of Dwarka. Lord Krishna is enjoying life in Dwarka according to the Vedic custom of society. He was situated in detachment and knowledge as enunciated by the Sankhya system of philosophy. So Lord Krishna is Bhagavan and these are two opulences of Bhagavan, knowledge and detachment. Certainly Krishna has all knowledge. He could speak the Bhagavad Gita in the middle of a battlefield. We study it our whole lives. But Krishna spoke it just off the cuff in the middle of the battlefield. So Lord Krishna is in, very enlightened in knowledge. We see also, you can read the 11th canto, you can read the Uddhava Gita, Lord Krishna's instructions to Uddhava. They're also very enlightening. And Lord Krishna also has this wonderful quality of detachment. Although he possesses all kinds of wonderful attributes, he's not attached to anything. He's renounced, he's detached. And he shows this detachment. He showed it here. Of course, first of all, he's showing the example of householder life. But later on, he shows also the, the example of detachment and renunciation. Even in his householder life, Lord Krishna was not attached, but it appears like he's attached. That is Lord Krishna playing the part of the ideal householder. Just a little bit from the purport here, I noted, the Lord was acting freely as he willed, yet by his practical example he taught not to lead a life which goes against the principles of detachment and knowledge. Reading on, attainment of knowledge and detachment, as very elaborately discussed in Sankhya philosophy, is the real perfection of life. Knowledge means to know the mission of the human form of life is to end all the miseries of material existence, and that in spite of having to fulfill the bodily necessities in a regulated way, one must be detached from such animal life. Fulfilling the demands of the body is animal life, and fulfilling the mission of the spirit soul is the human mission. So Lord Krishna comes to this world to enforce these teachings, to show us what is the actual mission of the human life. And in the course of his pastimes, he's also teaching us, he's showing us the nature of the material existence. And particularly with the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty, he's showing us the nature of the material enjoyment. You work very hard, you may acquire so much wealth and big position, but it's all temporary. You're going to lose it all at the end of life. That is the nature of the material world. That whatever you may acquire here, you cannot keep it. It's not yours. You have to renounce it. So we have to become detached. At the end of life, we have to become detached. You have to give up everything. If you don't give it up yourself, it will be taken from you by force. So we have that choice. Either you give it yourself or it will be taken by force. It's definitely better you give it rather than have it taken by force. But to give it, you have to have that detachment. You have to be willing to let go. This is the problem. People often come and they don't want to let go of their material attachments. And if you hold on to the material world, then 
that will be a problem. Then you cannot expect to progress in spiritual life. It's like having one foot on one boat and one foot in another boat. Now if you've got one foot, each foot is in a different boat, then you're going to have problems. One boat's going to go a different direction from the other. So we try to hold on to the material world, at the same time we want to enjoy the spiritual world. That's very difficult. You're not going to be able to do it very well. Certainly you're going to get problems. We have to be willing to let go of the material attachments. And Lord Krishna teaches us the nature of this material world. He's showing us by his pastimes. Okay, going ahead, text number 20. He was there in his transcendental body, the residence of the goddess of fortune, with his usual gentle and sweet smiling face, his nectarian words and his flawless character. So everything about Lord Krishna is very pleasing, it's very attractive. His words, gentle, smiling face, nectarian words, his character also flawless. This is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Everything is perfect. And Lord Krishna shows also in, in his life that perfect example, perfect detachment. Prabhupada notes in the purport, he said, Lord Krishna is detached from the variety, from the variegatedness of the inferior nature, but he is in eternal blissful enjoyment of the spiritual nature or his internal potency. Yep, we may hear, because it's mentioned here, that Lord Krishna's body is a uh, the residence of the goddess of fortune. So we may think, well, that's attachment, right? He must be very attached. He's got his goddess of fortune on his chest there. And so that's material sense gratification. We have to understand that is not material sense gratification. There's no contradiction. The Lord is detached, but he has his internal potency. There's the external potency and there is the internal potency. So when the goddess of fortune is described, that is related to the internal potency of the Lord. There is nothing to do with the maya potency, the what we call bahiranga shakti, right? But the goddess of fortune, that is antaranga shakti or chit shakti, it's the internal potency of the Lord, and that is eternal, and that is spiritual, is uh, para, -prakri para prakriti. That is the superior prakriti. It's, it's not material. So p ordinary people, they, they become confused. They cannot understand. The pastimes of the Lord are very difficult to understand. So when we hear about Lord Krishna being detached, and when we hear he has also goddess of fortune and so many wives, we think, oh, he's a big enjoyer, he's a sense gratifier. There was a one pastime, one professor came to Prabhupada, to meet Prabhupada in his room in USA. The professor, he was a professor of Hindu studies, and he came in to the room and he said, how, he, he said to Prabhupada, how can you worship a god who is an adulterer? Adultery means you have more than one wife. And so Prabhupada said to the professor, he said, do you have a wife? He said, yeah, I have my wife, I have one wife. And Prabhupada said to him, he said, you are the adulterer. He said, all women belong to Krishna. So when Krishna married 16,108 wives, that, he could have married more, he could have married 16 million wives. All women belong to Krishna, everything is Krishna's property. 
So one man is he's having one wife, he's enjoying with one wife. That wife, his wife actually belongs to Krishna. Everything is Krishna's property. We are all Krishna's property. We're all meant for Krishna's enjoyment. So material world, men and women enjoy each other. That is not proper. We're actually all meant for Krishna's pleasure. So when Lord Krishna comes to this world, he married, he's, he accepted 16,108 wives, but they're all his property. It's all meant for his enjoyment and his enjoyment with the goddess of fortune. It is not material. It is the internal potency. It's the antaranga shakti, right? Our enjoyment, our playing around material world, that is the maya. That is the external potency. All right, so this is explained here, Lord Krishna's pastimes. The Lord's always joyful and he enjoys himself. And he enjoys himself with his wives, with his queens, with the goddesses of fortune. He enjoys in every way. He enjoys fighting with the demons. He enjoys killing them. He enjoys also being with his devotees and being with the cows and the brahmanas. It's all pleasure for Krishna. Going ahead, text 21. The Lord enjoyed his pastimes both in this world and in other worlds, higher planets, specifically in the association of the Yadu dynasty. At leisure hours offered, offered by night, he enjoyed the friendship of conjugal love with women. Lord Krishna has his wives, he enjoys with them. But it's not material, it's not mundane, it's not sense, it's not just ordinary illusion or sense gratification. The Lord is the supreme enjoyer and all of these wives are his property. They're meant for his pleasure. Prabhupada's purport, just I marked this region, he, dis he displayed special attachment for his family members, the Yadus, as well as for his 16,000 wives who had the opportunity to meet him in the leisure hours of night. All these attachments of the Lord are manifestations of his internal potency, of which the external potency is only a shadow representation. Yeah, the Maya potency, Maya is related to Krishna like that. It is like the shadow. It is described like that in the Brahma Samhita, that Maya moves like a shadow under the control of the Supreme Lord. Maya, the material energy is not independent. It's all under his control. And Prabhupada also mentions about Lord Krishna's wives. He said, the 16,000 cowherd damsels are displays of 16 varieties of internal potencies. It is said there that Lord Krishna is just like the moon and the damsels, part of his internal potencies are like the stars around the moon. So Lord Krishna is like the moon and the damsels are like the stars around the moon. The damsels, it's mentioned, they're compared like cowherd girls, cowherd damsels, it's actually mentioned later on in 10th Canto, if you go to chapter 59, text number 43, there's a reference there about the Lord Krishna's 16,000 wives that initially they were cowherd girls and they became the daughters of kings. And then they were captured by Narakasura and Lord Krishna killed Narakasura and took all of them 
as his wives. So like that, I said 16 different potencies of Lord Krishna. And each, each of the 16 potencies has a thousand subdivisions. And so this, this is how Lord Krishna had 16,000 wives. This is the significance of that. Okay, going ahead, text 22. The Lord was thus engaged in householder life for many, many years. But at last, his detachment from ephemeral sex life was fully manifested. So the Lord is showing the example, householder life. It, it, this is... This is part of the Vedic culture. You should take a wife and live in family life. But then we should remember that the Vedic culture also recommends that at a certain point you have to renounce family life. Successful householder life is where you move on. In the Vedic culture, after Grihastha ashram, there is the Vanaprastha ashram. So detachment has to be cultivated before the end of life. You don't just simply wait for death to come to take everything away. That will be very bad. One has to personally cultivate detachment. So the Vedas say, from the age of 50, one should go to live in the forest, or one should retire from the family life and take up spiritual life. There's no retirement from spiritual life. You retire from material life. So family life is encouraged. Have a family, get married, have children. But don't stay there forever. You have to also renounce. You have to give it up at a certain point. And Lord Krishna shows this example. It's mentioned here. He remained a householder for many, many years just to teach others how one should live in householder life. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti explains that the word huh, sama, samajayata means fully exhibited in all his activities while present on the earth. The Lord exhibited detachment. This was fully displayed when he wanted to teach by example that one should not remain attached to household life for all the days of one's life. One should naturally develop detachment as a matter of course. The Lord's detachment from household life does not indicate detachment from his eternal associates, the transcendental cowherd damsels. So this is an important point. We have to understand there, there is Lord's eternal associates and the Lord is not required to get detached from them. That is the eternal relationship. And then Prabhupada continues, but the Lord desired to end his so-called attachment to the three modes of material nature. He can never be detached from the from the the service of of his transcendental associates like Rukmini and other goddesses of fortune, as described in Brahma Samhita. So Lord Krishna is never detached from his associates like Rukmini and the goddess of fortune. He's never detached, but. We see also, he, he, he does enjoy teasing with them. And we can read in the Srimad Bhagavatam how Lord Krishna would sometimes tease Rukmini and he would joke with her and he would tell her that, you know, I'm not wor worthy to be your husband. At the time they already had grandchildren. They'd already been together for many years. But Lord Krishna is joking with Rukmini and he's telling her, Oh, I'm not worthy for you. You should have married a king. Other kings were there. I'm just a cowherd boy. I'm from a cowherd family and like that. <laughs> so Rukmini faints. So Krishna would enjoy teasing 
teasing words with her. And we see also Lord Krishna was here in this past in the past time with the Yadu dynasty. He married Rukmini, but then the Yadu dynasty annihilated each other. So, and at the end, everyone gave up their bodies. All the different wives, everyone, they all entered the fire when the bodies were burned. They also entered the fire to live with their husbands. And so Rukmini also like. It, it's described like that in Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, text 23, we hear about Lord Krishna's uh, sense activities. No one therefore can put his faith in Lord Krishna's transcendental sense activities, ex but one who has become a devotee of the Lord by rendering devotional service. So without being a devotee, we won't be able to understand the pastimes of Lord Krishna. And we see there are many people, they try, they, they talk about Krishna, they don't understand, they don't understand the dealings of Krishna, they want to imitate Krishna, and they talk about the gopis, they may talk about so many things, but they don't understand properly. So we have to hear from Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada notes here in the purport, no one is independent in obtaining sense enjoyment and everyone in this material world is after sense enjoyment. Persons who are themselves under the control of supernatural power cannot, cannot believe that Lord Krishna is not under any control beyond himself in the matter of sense enjoyment. So because, because people in the material world, we're under the control of supernatural powers. So we cannot believe that Krishna is not under control of supernatural power. We're always limited. And so many laws of nature are there for us. We're restricted in so many ways. The law of karma is there for us. The, the, we have a material body. We're subject to old age, disease and death. So the people, ordinary people think Krishna must also be subject to all these things. But no, it's not like that. Krishna doesn't have a material body. He's not like us. We have to understand he's of a very different nature. He is the Supreme Lord. He's above everyone. He controls the material nature. One who has limited sense, senses cannot believe that the Lord can eat by his transcendental power of hearing. And he can perform the act of sex life simply by seeing. This is the omnipotency of the Lord. He can do everything. Any one sense can perform the activities of any other senses. So here is mentioned, Prabhupada said, simply by seeing, he can perform the act of sex. And so this is inconceivable for us. We are conditioned souls. But the Lord, he is completely above the material nature. He can do anything with any one of his senses. All right, chap. Then text 24 goes on to speak about this annihilation of the Yadu dynasty. And we hear about the sages cursing that they'd all come to this holy place. And the great sages were made angry by the sporting activities of the princely descendants. So the young boys, the young princes, they took advantage. I told you about Samba. Samba, the son of Jambavati, he was dressed up like a woman, put a sari on, and they put this big metal lump on top of his stomach, making him look like he's pregnant. So here, Prabhupada comments about this cursing. The cursing of the princes by the sages was another transcendental pastime of the Lord to make a show of anger. The princes were cursed in order that one may know 
that even the descendants of the Lord, who could never be vanquished by any act of material nature, were subjected to the reactions of anger by great devotees of the Lord. One should therefore take great care and attention to, not to commit an offence at the feet of a devotee of the Lord. So this is the instruction we get from this pastime of the cursing of the Yadu dynasty, that we should not commit any offences, we should not offend any devotees, we shouldn't joke, fool around. No, young boys, of course. Now we should understand that these sages getting angry, these sages shouldn't get angry so easily. Everything was the arrangement of the Lord. First of all, the young boys, the Yadu dynasty, they're all saintly, they're born in a perfect family. Are they going to fool around and do things like this? It's all the arrangement of the Lord. It's the pastime of the Lord. Just like I was telling you about how Jara fired the arrow at the Lord, after Jara fired the arrow at Lord Krishna, then he came to Lord Krishna and apologized and he begged forgiveness and he, he was crying, he felt so guilty. But Lord Krishna just looked at him and smiled and said, I caused you to do it. I caused you to do this. And then Lord Krishna even took that hunter Jara he went to Vaikuntha, in the same body, he took him to Vaikuntha, he sent him to Vaikuntha. And so Lord Krishna here also, he's, he's the cause of this cursing. He is the supreme controller and he caused all of this, the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty. So we're told a few months passed, this was after the cursing, a few months passed after the cursing, and they had all gone to Prabhas. And those who are eternal devotees of the Lord, they did not leave but remained in Dwarka. But the incarnations of the demigods, they all went to Prabhas. And after arriving there, what did they do? They took bath at the place of pilgrimage. They offered their respects to the forefathers, demigods, great sages. They satisfied them. They gave cows to the brahmanas. They gave a lot of charity. So in the purport, Prabhupada talks about going to holy places. He said, you don't need to go to holy places. There's no need. If one is sufficiently advanced, you don't need to go to holy places. And Prabhupada quotes Naratam Das Thakur, to visit holy places of pilgrimage is another bewilderment of the mind because devotional service to the Lord at any place is the last word in spiritual perfection. You can do devotional service anywhere. We don't need to go to the holy place. The holy places are there. That's for the neophyte devotees, younger devotees, they can go to the holy places. But those who are more advanced, they'll do devotional service anywhere. Hmm? Everyone is obliged to pay the debt of gratitude, to repay the debt of gratitude. That is in relation to the, the sages going there and doing charity. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. You can hear me now? Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, where are we? Are you able to see this text? Text 27? No, Maharaj. No? no. Okay, let me go back. We'll open that again because we got disconnected. Now you can see it? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So we're on text 27, nearly finished here. So just tell us about the Brahmanas, what charity they were given, 
all kinds of things, elephants, horses, girls, insufficient land for maintenance. All these charities were meant for the brahmanas who were devoted entirely to the welfare of society, both spiritually and materially. So this was before Kali Yuga began. People were pious. And the brahmanas were somewhat pure, certainly, Lord Krishna's time. The Yadu dynasty there, the brahmanas there, would be good brahmanas. And they would receive charity from them. So giving charity to the brahmanas, it's, it's, this was to counteract the inauspicious omens which had been seen there in Dwarka. So they thought, how to counteract inauspiciousness? This is the proper way. When things are not going very well, we want to counteract us, the inauspiciousness, then people do things like this. They, they give charity, and they will go to holy places and do charity, and give away cows and land and so on like that. This is uh, one method of counting. Of course, the, the proper method of atonement is that one should take up devotional service. But this, this is the Yadu dynasty, they're setting an example for the world by their behavior, that they're giving charity, and they're pleasing all the brahmanas. And then what happens? After they offered the brahmanas highly delicious food, first offered to the personality of Godhead, and offered their respectful obeisances by touching their heads to the ground. They lived perfectly protected. Oh, they lived perfectly by protecting the cows and the brahmanas. So, Uddhava is describing about the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty. He's describing, first of all, what they, what they did before they began intoxicating and before they began fighting with each other, how they performed all kinds of religious activities and they were very pious, they gave so much charity. So Prabhupada notes the perfection of human life is attained by following three principles of civilization. Protecting the cows, maintaining the Brahminical culture, and above all, becoming a pure devotee of the Lord. So most important is you should become a pure devotee of the Lord. And this is most important. So all of these devotees, the Yadu dynasty, they were all the associates of Lord Krishna. As we say, some are demigods and others are his eternal associates, Nijasiddhas. So human life is meant for cultivating our spiritual qualities. So going to the holy place, it, it can help, but devotional service can be done anywhere. Giving charity in the Kali Yuga, it's giving charity is best done in Krishna consciousness. We give to the Krishna Consciousness Movement. That's the best charity to give to the Krishna Consciousness Movement for the propagation of Krishna Consciousness. And we give to devotees. We, the devotees, of course, the devotees also, they should use whatever charity they receive. They should use it for the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Everything belongs to Krishna and we should use it for his service. So Prabhupada talks about the brahmanas and the duty of the brahmanas. They should teach the absolute truth. They should show the right example. And it's mentioned also how they offered the food, that before they fed the brahmanas, they first of all offered the food to Krishna, to the Supreme Lord, and then they gave them prasadam. We don't take food without first offering it. That's important. If we eat food without offering, then it's, it's got karma. 
So these are all important points to be noted. Uh, just read a little bit here. The Yadus or any enlightened family in Vedic culture are trained for attainment of human perfection by total cooperation of service between the different divisions of social orders. They will work together with each other, no conflict. The Vaishyas will give charity to provide for the needs of the Brahmanas. And the Kshatriya kings will take taxis to use it for the benefit of the people. They will cooperate with each other. Another point, devotional service is the only criterion for a bona fide offering to the Lord. Okay, and then the whole incident was a warning to all concerned that no one should behave lightly with the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. So Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, very powerful people. So be very careful. Hare Krishna, any questions? Yes, Thank you very much for the very enlightening class, Maharaj. I wanted to ask that how did Lord Balaram, you know, leave this world? Lord Balaram left the world. He was also there fighting, and then what happened at one after they all killed each other? Then Lord Balaram sat down in meditation, and in one place it says that Seshanag came out from his mouth, and from. Seshana came out from his mouth and Lord Balaram entered into that Seshana and then disappeared. Thank you, thank you. And it's mentioned also about the wives of Balaram, Lord Balaram, they also came and they also entered into the fire. When they did the last rites for Lord Balaram, they also entered into the fire. Hare Krishna. Uh, one question that uh, here we say that after the Jeev Goswami commentary, we understand that uh, the Yabu dynasty was banished so that the mother earth will not feel separation. But, like, how was it like because uh, they died, uh, they were going to die later also, and now also they died earlier. So, how does it affect mothers? Like, uh, I didn't completely understand. Well, I don't completely understand what you're saying. You have to speak a bit clearer, Prabhu. You're talking about Mother Earth. What happened? So, through the perfect, uh, we understand that uh, uh, Lord Krishna killed all the Yadu dynasty so that Mother Earth doesn't feel separation, uh, doesn't feel uh, burden of separation. Uh huh. So, like they were going to be vanished later also, and now they earlier vanished. So how does it make difference, uh, Maharaj? Well, no, the point was that the burden of separation, the pain of separation was going to be there, right? We spoke about there's the burden of the beast and the burden of love, but even greater than the burden of love is the burden of separation. So Lord Krishna was thinking that if he left first, it would create chaos on the planet because the Yadu dynasty would be there and they would just, you know, they would be unbearably distressed to think that Lord Krishna had gone and left them. And they would, they would just create havoc on the planet because there were so many of them and they were so powerful and nobody could kill them because they were so powerful. So Lord Krishna arranged that they would come and kill each other. When they, when they killed each other, then Lord Krishna left the, the planet. So the pain of separation, the pain of se Lord Krishna was concerned that the pain of separation, meaning that separation between the Yadu dynasty and Krishna, that pain of separation. It was the separation between the Yadu dynasty and Krishna. Thank you. 
विष्णु मनोज प्रणाम प्रणाम महाराज <laughs> uh but usually we see even in the vedic times also or in the history that uh, even monarchy also had led to uh, problems in the society like when we see kamsa ruling the world and when veda ruling the world no it also had its problems so uh, uh, then how can we comment that even you know democracy is also a problem in ruling the world we, it's true that, that, that there has to be a god conscious king that's the point that's why lord krishna put maharaj yudhishthir on the throne we said his maharaj yudhishthir was a conscious person because he was a devotee so he could be the king so there's if you have a a, a king like kamsa or like venu then it's a big problem of yes definitely and we see when venu was the king the brahmanas cursed venu but they produced another king prithu and prithu became the king so the monarch is the monarch system is good but the monarch has to be god conscious as well it's not enough just to have a monarch but he must be a, a devotee he must be a devotee king that is the main point and that how is why the uh, king be appointed maharaj because uh, how will this god conscious king will be selected so that the uh, so that the uh no the material laws are so that the citizens are happy because uh, there is no guarantee that the son of the king will be god conscious yes but well, we see when maharaj parikshit was born they had the astrologers and the astro astrologers tell us what kind of qualities this child will have and they can predict things just like when duryod when duryodhan was born they saw so many bad things many bad omens and they were even they were even they were even telling gandhari that oh you know this child is useless just kill it just get rid of it it's useless it's no good so they can tell oh, there are different omens and astrology you can do things like that you that's why the birth chart usually with the birth of the child they will get the astrologers to make some predictions what is the nature of this child so you can see many things from the birth chart so astrology is a guide to some of these things it is some indication it's not 100% of course in the kali yuga we don't get good astrologers very much but it's an indication there is some indications there and so you want to, you want a king a god conscious king training is also very important we heard it's not the parents themselves are not enough you have to have that proper association with the proper association so somebody is born in a royal family they should be trained in detachment they should be sent to a proper school where they can cultivate the good qualities suitable for their position as a king and and in the past that was the system that the rulers the kings they would send their children to the gurukula just like lord krishna and balaram went to sandipani muni's ashram and they stayed there of course they didn't stay very long but they learned everything and it it was the culture that those people from the wealthy and influential families they would send their children to the guru's ashram to train them to be detached from sense gratification and to help them to cultivate spiritual qualities so education and training is very important and then we question question comes that then the duryodhana kamsa veena they all did not uh, undergo this training because of which or or you know be, uh, how could uh, they were elected to become the kings maharaj just uh, adding for that well duryodhan they, be, they he didn't actually become the king it was his father who was the king 
Dhritarashtra became the king because Pandu died. And when Pandu died, the Pandavas were all very young children, so they couldn't become the king, so they gave the throne to Dhritarashtra. So Dhritarashtra was the king and he was under the control of his eldest son, who was Duryodhana. So Duryodhana is the eldest son, he had a big influence over his father. But they, all, they were all trained by Drona. Drona was a guru, he taught them military arts. Right? He taught them all the thing, the military arts, the, the culture of the Kshatriya. They did have the gurus there. They had Kripacharya, they had Dronacharya there. They were hearing, they were learning. Definitely these kings like that, they had, they had, they had their priests, they had their gurus. That was part of the royal family. In every royal family, every king, they would have brahmanas there to educate and train and, and tell, teach the, the family about religious principles, and give advice. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, they... Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Actually, I have one question, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, in 25th sloka, actually, it was mentioned like, uh, mm, who are incarnations of demigods went to Prabhasa, while those who were eternal devotees of the Lord did not leave but remained in Dwarka. Who were remained in Dwarka, Maharaj? Uddhava was there. Who else was there, Maharaj? And what happened to them, Maharaj? How they may disappear from this world, if not in Prabhasa? Yes. Uh... Those who were not in Prabhasa, what happened was Daruka came back from Prabhas and he told them what happened. He told, he told everybody what had happened, how they'd all annihilated each other and they'd all left the world. And so it, said, it says in the Srimad Bhagavatam that Vasudeva and Devaki, they just, they just fell down dead. They just, they just fainted and just died immediately on the spot when they heard that Lord Krishna had left the world and everything had been finished. They, they, they just fell down dead and, and the, the different queens and so on, they all went there and they did the funeral rites, they did the last rites and they all performed sati. They entered into the fire as they were burning the bodies of all the dead, the dead uh, kings who'd been, who'd been fighting and who'd, who'd been killed by each other. They had to do the cremation, so they built this fire and they did the last rites for each one and they all entered into the fire. That's how it seems to be described in the 11th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. It's the 11th canto and it's the, the last two chapters of the 11th canto. One is the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty and then you have the annihilation, how Lord Krishna leaves the planet. So it's there in the, the very last chapter, 31 I think it is, in the 11th canto. And it describes how Lord Krishna left the world and what happened to all the people who were there in Dwarka. And they went there and they, they just, everybody just gave up their bodies. There were some people somehow remaining, I'm not sure who they were, there was a few ladies. Arjuna, the, Arjuna was told to take care of them and Arjuna was bringing them. But practically everybody, they just gave up their bodies. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, okay. uh, actually, this Satikya and the Krutavarma, with them only the fight has started between the Yadus like that I and Maharaj. But whether Satikya and uh, Krutavarma, they are from baby gods or uh, they are the Etna associates of the Lord Maharaj. Kartikeya? Satyaki and Krutavarma. Krutavarma? And Satyaki, Satyaki. Satyaki? Satyaki. What about them? Uh, are they uh, from the demigods or uh, they are from the eternal associates of the Lord, Maharaj? Oh. Well, Sadyaki may be an eternal associate of the Lord, but I don't know about Kartikeya. <laughs> Kartikeya. The Kartikeya is a demigod, right? Son of Lord Shiva. Uh, 
There's so many people involved, so many there. I don't think they're eternal associates of Krishna. It's mentioned even Akrura was there fighting and he also died. And, and Samba and people like that, they were all fighting and kill, get, being killed. And so, I, you know, I was surprised because I would have thought Samba and people like Akrura were eternal associates, but no. They're all mentioned that they're fighting and they're killed at Prabhas. But Daruka is mentioned, Daruka goes back, he has to take Krishna's chariot back to Dwarka and to tell everyone. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so then we'll finish here today and we'll meet again next week for the fourth chapter. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gorbhakta Vrinda Ki. Hare Krishna.